We now move on to leaders' questions. I call on Deputy Sean O'Friel. Uh, uh, you will be aware of the huge concern there is around the country about the ability of the health services executive being able to deliver frontline services in 2014, particularly when it is faced with the cut of 666, as referred to here in the budget debate by uh, Minister Riley, or perhaps even upwards of a billion euro, as referred to by the Chief Executive of the HSE. Now, the letters from the CEOs recently reaffirmed these concerns and have heightened public concern, I think, across the country. And the government is convinced that patient safety will not be jeopardised because they tell us that money will follow the patient. I've put it to you, Tanish, that the money is not following the patient, particularly in relation to children with life-limiting conditions. Dr Owen Smith has confirmed that there are already delays giving chemotherapy to children with cancer when they are in hospital, and sadly, there is very little support for families who wish to care for their children at home. There is no ring-fenced funding for home care teams or nursing care on a 24-hour basis. Uh, and families are being refused medical cards uh, as they are seen uh, to be over the income limits, although the reality is that they are experiencing very serious economic uh, difficulties caring round the clock effectively for their very sick children. So what I want to ask you today, Tanishta, is why is your government on the one hand apparently committed to the uni universality of health care? introducing something that we've all welcomed, free GP care to children uh, of six years of age or under. But at the same time, you're not allowing children with life-limiting conditions have medical cards. Uh, and indeed, uh, it is the case that your government stands indicted for the fact that it does not have dedicated palliative care funding uh, for the home care of children uh, suffering from life-limiting conditions. Well, first of all, uh, I want to say that the government's uh, priority in the area of health uh, is to ensure uh, that patient care uh, is at the very top uh, of all considerations. It is unfortunately the case uh, that the budgets for the health services have had to be reduced uh, in recent years, and that, of course, as we know, is because of the uh, incredible mess uh, in the public finances uh, that the present government uh, inherited. Uh, there's no doubt that this year too will be a challenging year for the health services, um, but as I said, the uh, priority of government is the protection of frontline services uh, and patient uh, safety, uh, and in particular uh, to ensure that priority is given uh, to patient safety and patient care. Uh, for, uh, for children. That is something that we, we certainly want to see uh, taking place. Within that very challenging uh, financial uh, environment, uh, we have been progressing with the reform uh, of the health services. Uh, those reforms have been overdue for a very long time. Uh, they involve changes in the way in which our uh, hospitals are configured to ensure that patients get the best care. Uh, they also involve uh, the move to uh, universal health care, particularly universal uh, health insurance. And in this year's uh, budget, we announced that we're taking the first steps uh, in that direction by the uh, introduction of free GP care uh, for children uh, under five. I recognise, and I think we all recognise, uh, that there are uh, continuing challenges and problems uh, in, the, uh, in the health services. Uh, they have to be uh, addressed. Uh, we, are, uh, we are working uh, on that. Uh, we have made quite an amount of uh, progress, um, despite uh, having less money uh, and fewer uh, staff. Uh, we are undertaking the biggest reform of the hospital system uh, in the history uh, of the state, um, including the way in which uh, consultants work, including the introduction of uh, universal health in insurance. Uh, we have reduced waiting lists, reduced trolley numbers. We've established uh, since uh, the middle of 2011 32 uh, new primary care centres. Uh, as I've said, the uh, introduction uh, this year of free GP care for, uh, for under fives. Uh, we've committed to the building of the National uh, Children's uh, Hospital uh, and a new National uh, Maternity Hospital, 200 million provided for that uh, in, the, uh, in, in, uh, in the budget. Um, 
the number of patients uh, that waiting on trolleys have been reduced by uh, 30 per cent since the, uh, since the government uh, took office. The number of adults waiting more than 12 months for inpatient and daycare surgery reduced by 73 per cent. Thank you. Um, so progress is being made, uh, but in a service which is uh, demand-led, uh, where there are uh, growing demands uh, all of the time, uh, there is clearly a lot more that needs to be done. Thank you, Tony. I'm disappointed with your response, I have to say, Tony. You talk about reform and you talk about statistics. The reality are, is that we have about 1,400 children nationwide who have life-limiting uh, conditions that are being looked after by the Jack and Jill uh, Foundation primarily. About 350 of those children die per annum. Now, we all acknowledge uh, that we're in extremely difficult economic circumstances. And perhaps we can have the luxury on another day of discussing how we got into those circumstances. But you and your government are currently responsible for dealing with the situation. And I would say to you, Tánaiste, that your government is indicted in a situation where you cannot and have not prioritised the care of children. And the care of those children has been left to a voluntary organisation. The Trinity study commissioned by the Jack and Jill Foundation, run by a man in excess of 70 years of age, who is dedicating his life to the care of those children, has found that it would cost 16,500 euros to provide palliative care services for those children at home, whereas to provide for them in hospital, where many of them have to go and stay because your government is not addressing the problem, is costing nine times more, or about 150,000 euros per annum. That is not good for the National Exchequer, and it certainly isn't good for the children that are affected. Honest. I don't think that uh, any of us uh, should do anything other than go to every length to provide medical care for children and to look after children uh, when, they are, when they are ill. But you know, uh, it's very difficult sometimes uh, to uh, listen to lectures about the health service and particularly uh, about the health service for children uh, from uh, a party which neglected it so badly uh, in government. You talked and you looked around for years at the idea of a children's hospital. In good times, when there was money, when there was money, in good times, in good times, in, in good times, when there was when there was money uh, available, you didn't do it. This government, this government, this, this government, this government is proceeding with the building of the children's hospital which is long overdue we have provided we have provided we have provided we have provided, we have provided the funding uh, for that we have, we the the uh, priority that this government has is to ensure that we deliver the best quality of care particularly to children um, and uh, in every circumstance uh, where they have uh, a, medical, uh, a medical need. It is challenging at times because of the uh, limitations uh, on resources, but it is the government's priority to provide the best possible care for children uh, when they need it uh, when they, uh, and, and when they are ill. Deputy O'Brien. To understand the programme for government, you promised to, and I quote, increase the stock of social housing. But this morning and every morning, we hear the real human stories of families left by this government and the previous government languishing on the housing waiting list. Mothers struggling to feed their children and to pay their bills because they're being forced to live in poor quality and overpriced rental accommodation. The number of people on local authority housing lists continue to rise. The figures now touching 112,000 families on waiting lists throughout the state. Meanwhile, 3,500 council houses lie idle. In my own city of Cork, almost 8,000 families are on the housing waiting list, with a stock of 500 houses lying idle. And the number of people dependent on rent supplement is continuing to rise, and the cuts to that rent supplement are forcing more and more people into financial hardship, and in some cases, into homelessness. Homeless charities are reporting a significant increase in the number of people using their services. And Tarnished, the reason for this is very simple. Your government 
like the Fianna Fáil government before you, is slashing the budget for capital or for social housing. You have no plan to address the housing crisis in this state. Since you took office, Tarnishda, this government has cut the funding for social housing by more than half. That is why the waiting lists continue to grow. So, Tarnishda, when will you honour the programme for government commitment to start investing in social housing and to address the housing crisis? Thank you, Deputy. Tarnishda. Uh, well, first of all, approximately 5,000 additional social housing units uh, will be provided in 2014. Uh, this will include new build, uh, units leased from uh, the not-for-profit sector uh, and general leasing. Uh, we're also on track uh, to secure 500 social housing units from NAMA this year and will deliver 2,000 social housing units through NAMA uh, throughout uh, the lifetime uh, of, uh, of the government. Uh, in the recent budget, um, uh, we uh, returned, albeit on a uh, modest scale, uh, to mainstream housing construction, uh, and this is an issue that I hope we'll, we will be able uh, to expand on as the country's uh, finances uh, improve. Uh, the recent budget contained an additional €30 million Euro for social housing construction and refurbishment, um, approximately 50% uh, of this additional investment will be dedicated to bringing long-term vacant units back into use uh, in 2014. Uh, it's estimated that more than 300 units will benefit from this dedicated fund, uh, and in the coming weeks, local authorities will be asked uh, to submit uh, specific properties uh, for uh, investment. There is a problem in relation to vacant uh, housing stock. About 3% of the local authority housing stock uh, is vacant. Now, this includes what would normally be called the kind of the natural turnover that arises at any time uh, when tenancies end and uh, a new uh, tenancy uh, is, to be, uh, is to be appointed. There are, however, uh, a number of uh, local authority dwellings uh, that are vacant for an unacceptably uh, long uh, period uh, of time. Uh, and uh, those are uh, issues that, uh, that, have to be that have to be dealt with. I would hope that local authorities, with the resources that is being provided for uh, in the budget, will get to grips uh, with that problem and that we won't see uh, the uh, continuing problem of dwellings lying idle for a very long period of time, uh, which um, you know, is a waste in terms of the fact that there are people who are on housing lists uh, who could well be using them. Uh, is obviously a loss of revenue for the uh, local authority concerned, and in many cases uh, is a problem uh, for local uh, communities where uh, boarded up dwellings uh, constitute uh, something uh, of an eyesore. Deputy O'Brien. Just going on the figures you provided there, we're looking at probably an additional 7,500 units over the lifetime of this government. Now, we have a housing list of 112,000 families, so it's a drop in the ocean. And announcing 15 million here and 15 million there is just not going to compensate for the massive cuts that this government has overseen. 233 million cut from the capital budget in terms of housing, and you're talking about 30 million. It's just not good enough, Tarnisha. The reality is, the figures speak for themselves, and this government has abandoned those on social housing lists who are the most vulnerable in society, Tarnisha. So, what outline, please, for us and for those people and those families who are waiting for adequate housing and social housing lists, what is the long-term plan of this government? Because 15 million here and 15 million there just doesn't cut it. I'm over it, eh, Minister, and so are those families. Thank you. Tarnister. Well, I don't know if you missed it, but the country, uh, the country was broke. Um, the country ran out of money, um, Deputy, uh, the, at the end of 2010. And um, this government has had to restore uh, the country's finances. Now, we're in the fortunate position now, as we speak now, uh, that we have done that, uh, that we're about to uh, exit uh, from, the, uh, from the bailout. This government has not abandoned the issue of social housing. Far, far, far from it. Uh, to date, um, as I've said, uh, for 2014, uh, there's to be uh, 5,000 additional uh, social housing units uh, provided. Um, in the um, uh, additional funding has been provided in this year's budget uh, to recommence, uh, to recommence uh, housing construction. 
Uh, as I've said, it is intended that as the finances of the country improve, uh, that we will uh, improve on that. In addition to the construction uh, of houses, we've also uh, committed uh, to the upgrading of the energy efficiency of existing local authority dwellings. 25,000 local authority dwellings uh, will be uh, affected by that and be upgraded uh, in that uh, in that program. 4,000 of those uh, have been uh, upgraded in the first four months uh, of the program uh, already, um, and uh, we're going to to, uh, to continue with that. We're very much aware, thank you, very aware of the numbers of people who are on who are on housing lists uh, of their uh, of their housing uh, needs, and now that we have got ourselves to a situation. Uh, where we have stabilised the country's uh, finances, uh, moving out of, the, uh, out of the bailout, we have signalled very clearly in this year's budget uh, that social housing and the provision of social housing uh, is something uh, that we are addressing and will continue to address. Deb De Healy. Tarnished in April 2013 uh, on Bloomberg TV, Wilbur Ross, the American vulture capitalist, described Bank of Ireland as its best investment of the financial crisis anywhere in the world. Uh, and why wouldn't he? In July of 2011, your government tarnished the sold state shares in Bank of Ireland to a consortium of North American vulture capitalists for 1.123 billion euros. The effect of this sale is that the state now owns 15% of Bank of Ireland shares for a net cost of about 4 billion euros, while these vulture capitalists own 37% of the shares at a cost of 1.12 billion euros. The fire sale of these Bank of Ireland shares has handed Wilbur Ross and his wealthy associates a capital gain of 2 billion euros. So no wonder he'd be celebrating on television. And of course, they're on to a sure winner for the future also. And why might I say that? Of course, it's because the whole value of Bank of Ireland is determined by government support, including the bailout, but not just the bailout. And crucially, crucially, government policy designating Bank of Ireland as a pillar bank. Uh, and of course, the lack of competition, and we've seen ACC and Desk Bank, bank uh, leave recently. Ulster bank, is up in, Ulster bank is up in the air. But the lack of competition in the market and the guaranteed government support by way of the pillar status is a shareholder's dream, uh, Tarnishta. The pillar banks are now free to rip off customers, bully small businesses and distressed mortgage holders. Indeed, in today's Irish Independent, Charlie Weston tells us that uh, the introduction and increase of bank fees and charges will take a further €260 Euros per year from families and €270 million out of household finances in the economy. And this bank is the same bank, Tarnishta, that as we speak is sending Question, out letters to distressed mortgage holders, giving them three options, voluntary sale, voluntary repossession or eviction. Absolutely disgraced. Time is up, Deputy. The question, Tarnish, uh, I have for you is Is your government not ashamed of its role in allowing the Irish people to be blatantly ripped off by Bank of Ireland and Wilbur Ross and his associates? And if, if Bank of Ireland fails the ECB stress tests next year, will Wilbur Ross and his friends be forced to recapitalise the bank, or will the Irish people be forced to do the same again as they have done in the past? Thank you. And would, would you not agree? That's finally tarnished it, that the only solution that protects the, the citizens of this country when recapitalisation is required is indeed nationalisation. Thank you. Tarnished it. Well, no economy can function uh, without a banking uh, system uh, and without banks. Uh, when this government came to office at the beginning of uh, 2011, uh, the banks in this country uh, were on the point of collapse. Uh, people uh, in this country were taking their money uh, out of the banks. Uh, even small uh, depositors, uh, in many cases, uh, were going across the border uh, to move their money out of Irish banks and to put, it, uh, to put it elsewhere. One of the things that the government had to do in the early stages of its life was to stabilise uh, our, banking, um, uh, our banking system. And that's why we moved very quickly, at a very early stage, uh, to the uh, reorganisation of our banking system and the establishment, uh, the, the, the reorganisation of banks into, uh, into, into, uh, into, pillar, uh, into pillar banks. The banking system in this country uh, has now uh, stabilised. 
Um, Bank of Ireland, uh, as it happens, has been able to raise uh, funds uh, and been able to raise capital uh, in, the, uh, in, in the open uh, markets. Um, there is uh, progress being made right across uh, our banking system. That was a necessary part of the strategy that we had to pursue in order to get the country out of the incredible economic hole that it had been put in and that we uh, inherited. As it happens, uh, we are now at a point where uh, we are about to uh, exit uh, the, uh, the bailout. Uh, we are looking at an economy which is uh, growing again, although the growth is, is modest. Uh, we are seeing employment uh, being uh, created uh, in, the, in the country at the rate of about 3,000 uh, new jobs per month. We'd like to see that um, accelerated. At the end of the day, what we've got to drive on to achieve here, now that we have stabilised the banking situation, stabilised what has happened in our, in our public finances, what we now have to do is to drive on to create the jobs, attract the investment, uh, see our economy grow uh, at a faster rate, and ensure that the people of this country have jobs, have a secure future, have a decent income, have decent quality uh, uh, qu uh, public services, uh, and that is what is, uh, is going to happen, uh, and that is what we are, uh, we are directed uh, uh, to, uh, to doing. Stabilising the banking uh, system in this country uh, was a necessary part uh, of that. Uh, this government has, uh, has done that and has, uh, has achieved that, uh, and what we now have to do is to drive on, get the economic growth, get the jobs, uh, and get the increased prosperity that will come from a growing economy. Thank you. Deputy Healy, one minute. Thank you. Uh, Tony, can I ask you some specific questions in relation to the sale of these uh, bank shares, government shares? And I want to ask you, are you satisfied that the sale of these state shares to these vulture capitalists was above board and transparent. I want to further ask you, are you satisfied with a situation where a senior public servant involved in the sales process and who continued to deal on behalf of the state with banks, including Bank of Ireland, was enabled to take up a very senior post in Bank of Ireland? That post being Chief Executive, Sorry, Corporate Deborah. and Treasury, Bank of Ireland Group. We can't make allegations here. I'm not here, making any allegations. That's a fact. I want to ask the tarnished there, has the promised review of that, this situation taken place? And what has been the outcome of that review? Thank you. Minister. Yes, I am satisfied that the sale uh, of the shares was above board and uh, was, uh, was transparent. I think if you go back to the uh, period of time uh, involved, uh, I think there was very considerable welcome at that time uh, that uh, Bank of Ireland was able to, that the state was able to sell shares uh, in, uh, in Bank of Ireland. Um, I think um, uh, I, I'm not going to respond, Ken uh, Corla, to uh, allegations about uh, uh, individuals. Um, uh, I think there has. Uh, well, you did actually. You did, yeah. You did. You did. Uh, you did. Well, I'm answering the question. I am satisfied. Uh, that the sale of the shares was above board uh, and was transparent. Uh, and I am also satisfied that the actions that the government has taken in relation to uh, bringing stability to our banking system has been one of the foundation stones on which the recovery of this country's economy uh, has, has been built. I wish it were different. I wish, I wish we didn't have, I wish we didn't have uh, the crisis in the, in the banking system uh, that we that we that we that we inherited, and I am satisfied. Okay, yes, but you know, I'm not I, I'm not going to respond Thank about you, allegations Deputy. that you're making Thank about you. individuals who are outside of the house. If you want to make an allegation, if you want to make an allegation, no, 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 no stop that, stop that, stop that, stop that, stop that innuendo and side of the mouth, uh, side of the mouth allegations about people who are not in the house. If you want to make an allegation, if you want to make an allegation about an individual, make the make the allegation, and if you're sure enough of it, make it outside the house. Thank you. Yeah.